Hello everyone, welcome back to another car profile. This week it's a Toyota GT86 Group 4 car as chosen by J Black 201 Now this car has a 2 litre boxer engine and no it is not Subaru, although Subaru Toyota worked together to make the GT86 BRZ. We all know that story, but we're not going to talk about that here. Now in terms of the weight distribution of the car, uh, similar to the SLS but backwards, so obviously this one is 53.47 in terms of the weight distribution, so 53 over the front wheels there, 53%. Now in terms of the Group 4 stasis of the car, obviously the GT86 is a real car, uh, and there was actually a GT4 variation of the GT86 made, but it wasn't officially recognised by Toyota as a works car, so technically there isn't a GT4 car, but there is... The GT4 car that was made was raced in British GT. If you're interested in that, go Google away. Uh, but this car, specifically the GT86 Group 4 car, has been specially made, specifically made, for Gran Turismo Sports and the Group 4 category. Now, in terms of the drivetrain, it's front-engined rear-wheel drive. And in terms of the power and the weight and the torque here, we have, three, uh, well, we have an original 358 horsepower. The bop knocks that down to 355. The weight starts at 1200, that increases to 1284, so it's had a nerf here in terms of the 100 down to the 99, 107% that we now have. And then the torque figures, they only change slightly, it goes from 37.8 to 37.4 kilograms of force. Now in terms of the transmission, rev to the limiter, um, I kind of found that once you start to get the flashy point, you could change gear, or you could go all the way to the limiter, you didn't really lose that much speed over that period of, uh, of, of driving. So, you know, you can rev near the limiter, but when it starts flashing in terms of the bar, that's when I would change gear, unless you're about to approach a corner. And as always with the scores, we do these on medium tires now, because that's how we're doing the balance of performance, which we'll get onto shortly. Uh, max speed, 6.1, acceleration, 4.0, braking, 3.5, Cornering 3.5, stability 6.0. The stability one I'm a bit confused over because it feels ridiculously stable, this car. Even more so than the previous car that we did, the SLS. Uh, but this has a lower score. I don't know. But without further ado, let's jump to Dragon Trail Seaside first of all. And let's have a look at this car in a little bit more detail. So here we are at Dragon Trail Seaside then. And uh, this car is a handling car. I already knew that before I started, so... I'm expecting this to do worse than the SLS, the only other Group 4 car we've done so far. Um, so heading down towards Turn 1, braking seemed fine. Uh, one issue I did have at Turn 1, actually, was actually this second part. If I clip my tyre on the inside, it really gave the car a little bit of oversteer. Other than that, this car is absolutely superb in terms of handling. Like, there's no understeer at all. Like, even coming through here, which is where you would expect the understeer to happen, none. It handles curbs absolutely fine. Um, and as I said a little bit earlier on, Use all the revs. You can see here, I'm using the revs to the limit. That's what I found was best to do as we continue on there through sector one. Now, heading towards sector two, look how well we do this. Look at this. No braking. We just chuck it straight in. And it, it sticks and goes and doesn't understeer. It's amazing. So, in terms of a car, this is very much one of those cars that I would say, if you're new to GT Sport, drive this car. Or if you don't want an oversteery car or a car that just handles well, drive this car because it's actually really, really good in terms of stability. Uh, so heading down towards here, you could brake quite late as well. Obviously, it's not carrying that much speed because it's not got a lot of power in the grand scheme of it. Through there we go again. You can see we're actually down on our best there, but we have a good exit at the right-hander, so we'll be pulling that back. Now, chicane of death. Actually, it's not chicane of death at all in this car. I could flat it most laps. Occasionally, I'd have to lift slightly because I plebbed it a little bit, but look at that. Nice and clean. No drama. No lifting up at the front. It just goes through there very nicely. Um, you know, so nice and easy for this car, as I say. A beginner car in my opinion one that i would highly recommend people to use if you are struggling with oversteer or understeer in any other car in group four we need the last corner there now we kept it in third that time that was just give it a little bit of stability here but as we head towards the end of the lap now let's see what we get you can see our right lap times on the right hand side are very consistent and we get a 45 4 but as always with this we look at the optimums and the optimums are a 45 262 as we improved on lap 9 in sector 1 there so you can see optimum down to a 45 2 now where does that compare versus the mercedes sls at this circuit well, it is a tenth and a half down there, which is expected because the SLS has a lot more power or a lot more grunt, should I say, um, versus that GT86 boxer engine. So, you know, Polyphony obviously bopping there to the characteristics of the car. And I think they've, they've done it well. They've done it really well. We're at Interlagos now, which is a little bit more of a balanced circuit here. So, obviously, we're looking at the handling section on the inner section. Uh, it's got a power bit at the end of it as well. 
Uh, but I would argue that it's a bit more power than handling this circuit. We can look at curbs again. Uh, as we come through here, I did suffer with a tiny bit of understeer on this part only. You can see that I had to use all the curb there. And it's mainly because I'm pushing the car so much. Because it handles so well, you just want to carry more and more and more speed. And that's what I kept finding I was doing through that corner. So, you know, you do want to see a little bit there, but overall you don't actually understeer in this car. As we head towards this left-hander, see we're hitting the absolute peaks of the rev limiter there. Through there we go, absolutely no problems. I mean, I've said it like three or four times now, there's no understeer. I had a tiny bit in the turn one here and that's it uh, as we head towards this right hander so you do have to use the revs in this car uh, as you see i've dropped to third gear there just with the apex slightly there so i've not done that 100 percent correctly and then we chuck it into the right hander now we don't go to first i did find that you know going to first can cause the car to oversteer a little bit so staying second look at that you're already in the revs anyway so absolutely no issues as we head towards the right hander into the braking zone now one thing i did find and you notice a little bit here Trail braking and braking very hard as you start to turn. It does oversee the car quite easily, and we'll talk about more about that at Suzuka because it happens there as well as uh, we head towards the left hander. Now we drop into second gear. And we just want to plant our foot and look at that. No hassle at all as we leave that corner. We're going to head up now towards the start finish line. So again on the right hand side, we're just always in the 38. I mean, look at that. We've got 38.3, 38.3, 38.2, 38.4, 38.2. 2. This is the fastest lap I did, and it's actually a 38.0. We absolutely nailed this lap, to be honest with you, uh, as we head towards the line. You can do that. You know, when a car is this stable, you can nail the laps, lap after lap after lap. Now, in terms of the optimum there, we're down to a 37.968, which is sort of a barrier we're looking at for Group 4. So, you know, if you can get in the 37s, it seems like a pretty good shout so far. And just to compare against that Mercedes... Seven thousandths difference. So obviously, as as I said just before, the SLS had a lot more grunt. The Toyota very much more handling car. Very close at Inter Lagos. Very close indeed. Um, but yeah, Toyota GT86, a very good car in my opinion so far. So we jump to Suzuka. This is on racing medium. So this is where we actually do the bop test. So you know this is where it counts in terms of where the cars place. Uh, medium tire being the middle tire ground here. So uh, where I potentially think they should be bopped. Uh, you can see we're already on a 2067. Now, coming into turn one, um, you can see that a little bit of understeer, and then I occasionally got a bit of oversteer as well with trail braking. So, the one thing I found with this car is I assume the rear just gets so light um, that it just over rotates a little bit, and the front gets so heavy that it just causes a little bit of understeer. So, you just have to be careful with that. Uh, I, it's the only corner I've really found an issue with, other than that other one on Interlagos, which is like half a second of braking where it's a problem. Uh, but other than that, as I say, there's no one's... I mean, look at that. We're flat through that left. We're not normally flat through that left in most cars. You know, understeer is very minimal. It's just when you're braking, potentially. You just have to watch out for that. Obviously, with these tests, brake balance is always on zero. I always get asked that question because that's how Polyphony Digital intended the car to be balanced on zero. You know, when you adjust it to plus or minus, that is totally your, um, you know, your opinion, uh, how you drive, driving style, etc. Um, you know, I've done examples in the past where... Uh, lightning's been on plus one and I've been on minus one in the time trial and we got the same time same principle anyway we continue on out of the hairpin I did struggle with the hairpin with this car I couldn't decide between first or second there's positives and negatives for both uh, obviously positive you're at the top of the rev range so you're absolutely nuking it negative um, for first gear is oversteer uh, spoon no issues with understeer at all really uh, actually we've not really plebbed it I think one lap we did pleb it slightly uh, that'll be the 2077, I imagine, on lap number five. That was turn one. We just ran a little bit wide, but we didn't go fully wide. Now, coming up to 130R, this is how much it doesn't understeer now. I'm going to pretty much flat this. I'm going to stay in fifth gear to stop any form of understeer. Look at that. Oh, slight lift. I don't think I needed to lift there, though, as we head towards the braking zone. Uh, again, in this braking zone, when you start to turn, you'll feel the rear rotate a tiny bit. Nothing major. We cut us as we always do there. Penalties are on. Head towards the line. You can see our item down at a 206.570. Not sure whether that changes or not. But as we hit the line there, it does go down actually to a 528. Obviously, that was lap number 10. So that is going to be our optimum. But just to confirm for you folks, there you have it. 206.528 there, our optimum time. Now, I consider Suzuka to be even more balanced than Interlagos, in my opinion. Um, but let's see where it stacks up versus the Mercedes SLS there. And it's ahead. And it's ahead by a tenth. So very interesting that, very interesting indeed. So it seems that the GT86 fairly powerful in the grand scheme of it. SLS did get nerfed fairly recently, but I think the nerf is respectable. You know, it's competing there with the Toyota GT86. Now we go to the race, of course, the race that everybody enjoys. So flat out, first uh, traction control on one, 
Off we go. And this is the test of acceleration. We go up to 90 miles an hour here because there's not enough of a run up to get to 100 before turn one. So we go up to 90 as we're about to hit 90 now. 9.433 seconds. I can tell you that's very slow. Uh, this car is ridiculously slow. And you could tell that probably by the torque um, that we mentioned earlier. I think it was 37.4 I said. It's very slow. Very, very slow. Now, we're saying traction control a one there just to avoid any wheel spin, etc. Because you would use traction control if it's a grid start. Uh, so, we do it with all cars. Do the change of gear and then we and then we take it off. That way, it's even. An even spread across all the cars. Uh, and it's respectable. We do interlog our snort to 90 there as well. Because, literally, we're going uphill a little bit. So, it really demonstrates which cars are good accelerating. Which cars are not good accelerating. Now, we are also doing times, tire, times 10 tyre and times 10 fuel. I'm racing soft tyres here. So this race, four laps, is just a test of that tyre wear and the fuel usage to see how the car handles that situation. Now, in the past, the Toyota GT86 has been known for its tyre wear, being very good on tyre wear, I mean, in that situation. Not bad. Um, obviously, it got a significant nerf recently. Same with the Alfa Romeo in terms of its tyre wear. So I was actually expecting it to do a lot worse than it actually did because this car actually flies here. Now, what we will do, we'll advance to lap number four in a second. I'll just show you this first lap, just to give you an idea of how I'm driving the car. Uh, you know, you can moan at me if I'm like, revving it too much, but I'm just revving it how I would rev it based on the information I've gathered from the three previous tests that I've done uh, as we come through here. Now, I could have done that corner a little bit quicker. I'm going to head up the hill now. This is where we're going to advance to lap number four because you don't need to watch four laps of this. You know how Interlogos works. You've seen the fast lap just before. Looking at our fuel there, we're down to 22%. Obviously, that's going to go down by the time we get to the line, of course. As we head there now, down to 20%. Getting on just under that lap of fuel remaining there. So, we hit the line there, and we're on 19% fuel. Um, so, you know, it doesn't seem too bad. Uh, you know, special competitive group threes. However, we will compare that against the Mercedes in a second. Uh, we're going to jump to the tyres now. And tyre wear, superb still, honestly. 89% on that left rear. Like, literally, it's hardly worn. And you can see by the lap times, which we'll see in a second, just how good that is. Because it hardly loses any lap time across the four laps. As you see on the right side, look at that. 37,581, 37,591, 37,875. It's ridiculously fast. And that's a very quick race time as well. Uh, I will show all the information in just one second. That's faster than the Mercedes SLS, even though it's slower to 90 miles an hour. And you're going to see that now. So here's the acceleration for you. So, look at that. It's nearly two seconds slower to 90. Uh, oh, it says 0 to 100 there. I should say 0 to 90. I found a mistake. Oh, my word. Um, as we then go to the summary there. And you can see the difference there. Half a second up on the SLS, even though it's nearly two seconds slower off the line. That's significant. That's a big, big change. And look at the tyres as well. Significant advantage in tyres. So, the Toyota... A bot, very strong, I would say, at the moment. Um, it struggles in the race, of course, because it doesn't have that top-end speed to overtake. But, you know, very strong tyre wear races. It will be very much up there. So, if you want to pick the next car, or you want to see a car next, put in the comments. The comment now that gets the most thumbs up. So, you know, thumbs up, a comment that you already see. That's the one I'm going to use for the next car profile. But that's going to be it for me now, folks. Thanks very much for watching, and I will see you in another video or live stream very soon.